The reading of God's Word this morning comes from the book of Acts. Chapter 2, we'll be reading from verse 1 through verse 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them, and they were filled, all of them, with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and even parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues. The wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are just full of new wine. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, the the day on the church calendar, the liturgical calendar, where we remember and celebrate the Holy Spirit empowering, enlivening, animating the called gathering, the church. Um, We didn't reflect on it last Sunday because... It was, uh, it was Sherry's finally day, and we wanted, to, we wanted to bless her and give her a send-off. But I wanted to not pass by the topic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because I think, as on the day of Pentecost, there is a great confusion over the identity and role and work Uh, And then how we even respond in regard to the Holy Spirit. Some were amazed. Others, it said, perplexed, very confused. These people must be drunk, they said. Peter, of course, reminding them, no, it's only the third hour of the day. Uh, Being around 9 a.m., I guess for Peter, if it were 10, maybe that was possible. (laughs) But it's only 9, so it couldn't be alcohol. A lot of confusion around the Holy Spirit to this day. Uh, Terry Teekle wrote a book about praying in the Spirit, wherein he says that he has seen, even in the church, um, and he coined a phrase, he has seen what he called pneumophobia, uh, a healthy fear of the Spirit. Pneuma, of course, being the Greek word for spirit or breath, or wind, which is the word used in the New Testament for spirit. Phobia, of course, being a fear. People are afraid of the spirit. Many are. And he based it upon what was happening in churches in the 60s. Uh, There were a bunch of spirit-filled so-called churches, and there were some strange things happening in those churches, strange things in regard to folks within mainline uh, Protestantism. And so the Protestant church wanted wanted to swing as far away from anything spirit-filled. Now, I grew up, my mother reared me in a Pentecostal church, so I've, I've seen 
some of the things that go on in these spirit-filled churches. And, and if, you, if you weren't reared in a spirit-filled church, I could see where it would be a bit alarming. I have seen grown men just as, uh, as conservatively dressed as I am uh, sitting in a pew, and next thing you know, they're standing up sprinting through the church. And I don't mean like jogging 50, 50%. I mean 75 80% through the sanctuary. I've seen grown men run on the top of pews. I've seen grown men jump from one pew to the other and then stop dead in their tracks and roll on the ground with ecstasy on their face. And, and I don't think I need to stop preaching until every one of us in here are hurtling pews and rolling around on the floor. <laughs> not true, not true. But we may pull out some snakes. But there is confusion. And as Terry Teekle said, for some people, even fear when we mention the Holy Spirit. In fact, there are some translations in Scripture that use a different phrase for the Holy Spirit. They use a phrase that I heard in the church I grew up in. Uh, what we call the Holy Spirit was not the Holy Spirit. We called it the Holy Ghost. ghost. Yes. The Holy Ghost. I mean, that is spooky if you don't understand what they are referring to. And you can even really see it in the Apostles' Creed that we lift up week in and week out. In the first few centuries, uh, folks were really trying to get a handle on what the Scriptures meant by God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. And so the early church fathers came up with this manifesto which percolated in the late fourth century that we now call the Apostles' Creed, you can see it in that. I believe in God the Father, um, maker of heaven and earth, named several things about God the Father, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, buried, a laundry list of identifying marks in regard to the Father and the Son, but when it came to the Holy Spirit, it simply says, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, and goes on. So I would say not only could there be perhaps a pneumophobia in the church, but maybe, maybe, just, maybe you're not afraid of the Spirit, but you, have, uh, you may have a, what, I, what I'm calling a, a pneumomyopia. A myopia is just a, a clinical term for nearsightedness. Do you, do you remember watching uh, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner show? And uh, Foghorn Leghorn, uh, I, say, I, say, I say that boy, he would, he would talk to this little chicken hawk. And this little chicken hawk had glasses that were this thick because he couldn't see far away. He was nearsighted. And it may be just that our perspective of the Holy Spirit is, is something that, that we could expand just a bit. So what I wanted to do over the next um, 15, 20 minutes is bear witness to what the Scripture teaches about the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? And then reflect on how does that relate to us? Once I have a better understanding of the Spirit as taught in Scripture, how does it relate to me? In other words, so what? And then if I do know the so what, in what way do I respond? How do I say, receive the Holy Spirit if I am indeed interested. First thing I want you to know about what Scripture teaches is that it's not just a New Testament idea. The Spirit of God is seen from cover to cover. In fact, from Genesis 1 through Revelation. In Genesis 1, as God was creating, the Scripture says, and the Spirit of God, before He created land, stars, anything else, and the Spirit of God the, the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach. Say that, ruach. You'll sound really smart. Or like you're hawking up a loogie. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was seen empowering specific people to do specific tasks in specific times. And so you have the empowering of Bezalel in the book of Exodus, 
when it was time to create the Ark of the Covenant, he was, he was a master artist, artisan or craftsman, but the Spirit of God, it says, came over him and blessed him to do the work of the Ark of the Covenant. Later, when he built the tabernacle, um, you can go home and read that in Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. It was, it was the Spirit of God empowering him. Uh, later in Gideon's, you can, or Judges, you can see Gideon being empowered by the Spirit to lead God's people back to him. In fact, David was so familiar with the empowering of the Spirit, it was such a common thing for him, that in the 51st Psalm, which is agreed upon by most scholars that David wrote it, you hear him calling out to God, saying, please, in this time, in this place, don't take your spirit from me. I, I am in such dire need of your empowerment, your direction for the task that I have before me. In the Old Testament, mostly empowering specific people for specific tasks in specific times, but in the New Testament, you have something a bit different. It is universally offered, as we can see, on the day of Pentecost. Now, I will say before I get into the universal offering of the Spirit, that Jesus himself spoke of the Holy Spirit as something very personal. He spoke of it as, uh, as a comforter to the disciples. When I leave, you might get anxious that my presence is no longer with me, with you, but fear not, for God will still be with you just as near as I am through the Spirit when you call on it. Not only was Jesus saying it is as close to you as a comforter, but when you forget my teachings, Jesus said, it is the Holy Spirit that will animate your mind to remember what it was that I taught you. It's not something that just comforts you. It's something that clarifies your mind, helps you to discern the teaching of Jesus. Very personal and then universally offered, as you see in the book of Acts. Now, I want you to know that the day of Pentecost was not something that was made up then. You may have wondered why so many people were in Jerusalem at the time. Pentecost simply means uh, 50th. It was 50 days after the, uh, the Exodus. 50 days after the Exodus, it was celebrated as a Shavuot in Hebrew, uh, or the Feast of Seven Weeks, as some call it, or the Feast of Pentecost, because 50 days after the Exodus, when they were set free, it is thought that 50 days later is when they received the law. So they, the Hebrew people celebrated Pentecost for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were back in Jerusalem on this day because it was a pilgrimage feast. They just happened to be there for the already established Feast of Pentecost. And it was on that day that the Holy Spirit fell. Empowering universally the church empowering the church with gifts you can read about the gifts of the spirit in the books of romans chapter 12 gifts of serving gifts of teaching gifts of leadership in first corinthians chapter 12 the apostle paul writes of the gifts of wisdom the gifts of discernment the gifts of healing the Holy Spirit empowered the church. It was the power source. They had a, ta a task facing them that was far beyond anything they could do. Witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Not just here in Jerusalem, but to Samaria and to the ends of the world. A task beyond their capabilities. They saw what Jesus received when he tried to teach of his death and resurrection. And they were going to need something, a power beyond just themselves. And so they were blessed with the Holy Spirit. So how is it that that relates to me? The Holy Spirit is something that is ongoing in its availability to you. It is ongoing. Nicodemus had a, had a hard time receiving the idea of the Spirit when Jesus was describing it to him. Most folks are very familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that. But what you don't know is that verse is a result of Jesus' conversation with a Pharisee who was having a very difficult idea understanding the idea of the Spirit bringing new life to a person. 
Uh, I would say Nicodemus, he may have had pneumophobia. I would say more, more it was probably pneumomyopia. He, ju- he just didn't get it. When thinking of being reborn, the first thing that came to, to his mind was, it, it, does a man return into the womb of his mother? He said that. How are you born again? But the point being, Jesus was making the point that, that the Spirit gives one life. Therefore, it is an ongoing thing. What do you mean by that, preacher? Think about this. Your physical life, the life that you have been given, is a story that is ongoing. It it began before you. There is a story of a couple people that met, and hopefully you're sort of happy about that story, and you are a result of their story. So your story, your story, the story of your physical life was way before you even got here. But then the day you were born, it's not as if you were done with your physical life and its development. No, you had to be nurtured. You didn't know how to feed yourself. I've had several children. I've seen it happen. They have no clue. And even when you put it in their mouth, they want to just spit it out. You had to be nurtured. You had to be taught. You had a predisposition to hide things and lie and bite other kids in the sandbox. You had to have a a community to teach you what it meant to be human. And the same thing is true for your spiritual life. The Holy Spirit in your life is an ongoing event. It's not a one-time thing. Religious researchers say, on average, for people who, who witness to having the Spirit's activity in their life, that they say there are at least 10 to 12 very significant people, interactions with people in their life that led them to that point. Which is to say, the Spirit has been working in your life before you even received it for yourself. God was using His Spirit through other individuals to lead you to receiving Him for yourself. John Wesley called this provenient grace. Before you had even asked for the Spirit to come into your life, the Spirit was at work through other people wooing you to God. And then when you receive the Spirit, it's ongoing not not just to that point, it is an ongoing development from that point on. That is, John Wesley would call it sanctification. The Spirit is up to continuing to shape you spiritually, growing you up, as it were. It is an ongoing, available thing. That is how it relates to you. And so how do you respond? I would give you two questions. How invitational are you to the Holy Spirit? Because you respond by inviting the Holy Spirit into your life. How invitational are you? You are selectively invitational to certain people at your house. The pizza man comes over. How far does the pizza man get? Front door, maybe. Maybe invite them into the foyer. But the AC guy comes over, or girl, and they're going to get all the way in the house. You want the AC working in the middle of the summer. But are you going to let the AC guy all the way to your bedroom and wall around in your bed? No. However, if you had a a pest problem, and the pest control guy came in, he would make it all the way back to the bedroom. Even in your closets. No one goes in your closets. The pest guy does. You are selectively invitational. Okay, so hear this. How invitational have you been to the Spirit and the Spirit's activity in your life? There are plenty of places in your life that that the Spirit wants to reveal God's discernment on. And have you been invitational? Have you ever prayed for the Spirit to have its, its discerning way in your relationships? Spirit, guide me in this relationship. I'm just not sure. Have you invited the Holy Spirit into your financial life? Have you invited the Holy Spirit into the life of your physical health? Lord, there is something going on. I I know the thing that's leading me 
into this health place. I can't seem to stop it. Can you guide me? So how invitational have you been? That's how you can respond. And then, how open have you been to the invitation of the Holy Spirit into the life of the Spirit? Inviting the Holy Spirit into your life is one thing. Being open to answer the invitation of the Holy Spirit into the life of the Spirit is a whole other thing. Have you answered the invitation of the Holy Spirit into the life of the Spirit? Well, how in the world do I do that? I can't even see the Spirit. True. Like wind. You can't really see it, but you can see the effects of the wind. If the wind is blowing through the trees, you can see it. If the wind is blowing on the water, you can see it. And like a master salesman, as in a, uh, a sailor, not a selling something, where you see the wind's activity on the water, you get there and you hoist your sail. That's how you answer the invitation. So perhaps you've seen the Spirit moving in the life of someone in the church because the Spirit was the power source of the church. You want to know where the Spirit's activity is if you can't really see it? It is empowering the church. That's what it was doing the day of Pentecost. That's why it's the birthday of the church. Because the power source of the church was given. A car does not move without a power source of an engine. A light bulb does not come on without the power source of the electricity. And a church does not move. It does not witness. It does not serve a community. It does not light up the night of this cold world without the power source of the Holy Spirit. So perhaps you've seen in the church the move of the Spirit, say, in the prayer life of someone. There it is. It's inviting you in. Have you answered the call of the Spirit in your prayer life? Perhaps you've seen the move of the Holy Spirit in the church that is animating someone's devotion life and scripture reading. Have you answered that call personally? Perhaps you've seen the work of the Holy Spirit as someone answers the call to serve in different ways in the church. We have vacation Bible school all week this week. You want to know where to serve? I've never been asked to serve. I'm asking you. Vacation Bible school is next week. But the training is today. Right? The training is over lunch. Yeah, Vacation Bible School is next week. We have the youth trip this week. How many of you invited to go on the youth trip? Did y'all answer that call? No? Plenty of places to answer the invitation to serve in the church. So, how invitational have you been to the Spirit in your life? How open have you been to answering the invitation of the Holy Spirit into the life of the Spirit? Chew on those two questions. Let's pray. Holy God, for the birthday of your church, we give you thanks. We don't always celebrate it as we ought. And that very animating life source, which blessed it, quite often, we just either don't want to see it, or we do see it, and we just want to avoid it. But Lord, we believe you've given us fresh eyes this day. To hear its call, to see the Spirit's move, we pray that you would empower us this day. Where we have gifts, help us to see where those gifts are and to offer them to you. Lord, if, if we've been in the church for years and we have your Spirit, it comforts us every day, it guides us every day, then enable us to locate someone in our life and start praying for them. If they're not, if they're wanting more guidance from the Spirit, if they're wanting more comfort from the Spirit, if they're wanting to discern what their gifts are in the Spirit, then help us to pray for them, to mentor them to that point. And Lord, for those of us who haven't yet committed to following Jesus, and therefore we just we don't we don't see the Spirit's move, Lord, I pray for those, first of all, assure them they're in the right place. And open up their hearts. All Jesus said at the beginning of meeting people was, hey, spend time with me. Just follow me. And so we pray that you open their hearts 
just to maybe crack open the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and spend a little time with Jesus and open up their hearts to the move of the Spirit. All of these things we pray in your holy name. Amen.